All right, good, morning. good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Maryland Biothon training session. Um, tonight, we are going to be talking about aquatics. And our presenter this evening is Chelsea Miller, an aquatic resources educator here with the Department uh, Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Thank you to Chelsea for all you, the work you do for Marathon and preparing this exam for us this year. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here, being present tonight, this evening. And thank you, April, for coordinating this session and for the introduction. I just want to note that my coworker, Amy Henry, is also on this call. She's been an educator with the department for many years. Um, so if there's a question I can't answer, I'm sure she can help me out. And also, just to be transparent, I'm, you might be able to hear my dog crying in the background. Um, Hopefully that's the biggest disturbance it should be. So I apologize if you miss anything I say, um, just put it in the chat and we can go back over that later. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm going right into the PowerPoint. And as April said, I'll answer questions after that. Um, so here is our official regional training PowerPoint for 2021. You can go to the next slide. And this is covering the format of the state test. So we have four categories and they will be four different sections for your test. Abiotic, biotic, aquatic environments and water protection and conservation. Um, the fifth topic is sort of woven into all of these. And since it is um, the fifth topic is water controls, didn't have to do too much with the aquatics. Uh, it's already kind of in there. So I would not worry about that. Um, the test questions are gonna be fill in the blank and multiple choice for the most part. There is like a matching one, some short answers, drawing um, and some with like pictures like ID, uh, but mostly fill in the blank, blank and mostly multiple choice. Uh, as I said, the aquatic test has the sections and you can, go into whichever section whenever you want. So you don't have to start with abiotic. Uh, you can start with aquatic environments. The, the order does not matter. Um, and depending on the types of questions, you'll have a certain amount of time. And you can go to the next slide. So for abiotic, this category, this is the general concepts we want you to understand. Um, the water cycle, its role in nutrient erosion and climatic influences. Um, so basically understand how the water cycle works globally and how that water then gets back to you locally. That's an important one. Another thing would be watersheds, just in, in general, knowing the difference between a healthy and an unhealthy watershed knowing the uh, like the chemical properties, the physical properties, the way the shape of the watershed affects things. Again, knowing watersheds know the stream orders and understanding aquatic organisms and how the water quality affects them. But I would highlight the water cycle and highlight watersheds for the abiotic section. And moving to the next slide, Here's an image that I recommend you, you study through and through and know all these processes. Um, understanding that the main drivers that move the water cycle will be currents, wind, gravity, and solar heat. That's what will be moving our water. Understanding what happens after a precipitation event. Um, so what surface runoff, infiltration or seepage, what's going, what's happening with that precipitated water. And right on the left, it says freshwater storage and freshwater existing on the earth's surface. It's important to know there is not that much. There is only 3% of all water on earth is fresh water. Uh, so not a lot in the grander scheme of things. Um, to the next slide, is where I mentioned, so water cycle is important. Study that diagram, understand how much fresh water there is and what's happening to the precipitation. The other topic is what is a watershed? 
understanding that a watershed is a land area that drains into one stream, lake, or river. It's going to affect the water quality in the water body that it surrounds, and it provides us with a lot of services. The next bullet, it's showing why are watersheds so important, and you have two different things. You have economic benefits. Uh, these are a lot of things that are beneficial to us as humans and ecosystem services. And it's important to have, you know, a few examples of what these might be and to understand what they are. Some examples of ecosystem services would be improved water quality, um, carbon storage opportunities, increased resilience in the face of climate change, uh, reduced risk for invasive species to come into the habitat, and reduced efforts in water treatment and infrastructure costs. And the list goes on and on, um, but these are, you wanna have a handful of examples maybe and be able to explain how they are helpful or beneficial. And moving forward, the stream orders. Um, this one can get tricky. I would practice it, do some, do some drawings, do uh, take a map and see if you can do this uh, and figure out what the stream orders are on a on an actual map because you have your like ordered streams that are gonna combine and move up only one level. So for instance, one plus one is gonna equal two and three plus three is gonna equal four. However, unlike ordered streams combine and remain at the higher order level. So a two plus a one is gonna equal a two. Um, and this graphic, is really helpful to practice with. You can maybe take it, erase the numbers and practice on your own. Give, your ch give each other some quizzes maybe. And moving forward, stream runoff. You'll have a few questions on this. Um, and remember, remember all these factors that are affecting the rate and amount of runoff and those are different. So. The shape of a water fed, watershed is gonna affect the rate. The slope is gonna affect the rate. And then land use, so vegetation or development, that can affect the rate and the amount that's running off, as well as land geology and soils. Um, so for instance, shape could be the distance of a rain event to the discharge that can slow or increase. The slope, so we all know the steeper the slope, the faster it's gonna run off. Uh, if it's a forested area, so the land use or geology of the area, uh, the trees and plants will help absorb and um, slow that runoff. And then there's soils too. So in Maryland, there's a lot of clay soil and that's lower permeability than a sandy soil. So on your coastal plain, you'll have more sandy soils. And we can move forward. So here is, there's two graphics. One of them is just showing you an example of a riparian zone. Um, you wanna know what that is, what they look like. And below it is the floodplain, and these are different. Um, so the, the floodplain is the whole valley width, um, whereas the riparian zone is one segment. And on this slide, you've got your natural mechanisms and human induced mechanisms. And I have those here because I want you guys to be prepared of knowing examples of these um, and what, what they do to affect the stream flow and how they change it. So I'll, I'll give you some now, natural mechanisms. This is runoff from rainfall, snow melt. Um, you have evaporation from soil and surface water transpiration by vegetation, um, groundwater discharge from aquifers, um, and then some human-induced mechanisms would include uh, river flow regulation from hydropower and, let's see, navigation. So if they're changing things for navigation, like channels or um, channelizing streams, different construction. So sometimes when they're 
constructing and building different things. They'll have a retention pond, um, things like that. And onward to the next slide, this has the pH scale. And I'm sure you're all fairly familiar with the pH scale, just knowing what, what would be acidic, which numbers would be acidic. So seven is neutral, downwards towards zero are your acidic levels, upwards towards 15 is where you're getting more basic. And then understanding that most living organisms need a, you know, around us a, a neutral number to survive uh, and some notes just for, to understand what things need to survive is the average ocean pH is about 8.1. Um, to close to seven. Um, and if it goes too high, it's going to get more basic. If it goes lower than that, more acidic. Beyond pH, it's important to know temperature, salinity, and oxygen, how that impacts the aquatic wildlife and how they are related to each other. So cold water holds more oxygen than warm water. And then fresh water holds more oxygen than saline water or salty water. Cold fresh water, that's a lot of oxygen. Warm saline water, that's not good amount of oxygen. So a question people usually have is, is it warm fresh water that has more dissolved oxygen or cold saline water? And the answer for this is um, cold saline water should hold more oxygen than warm fresh water because temperature trumps salinity. And as you go deeper, you're also gonna lose oxygen. So for instance, a shaded stream will be a really great amount of dissolved oxygen. You'll be close to the surface, plants will be around, and the trees around the stream are gonna provide shade. That's gonna keep the temperature cold, and it's in a stream, most likely fresh water, so there should be a lot of oxygen in there. That's just an example. Um, and moving forward, I have a graphic of the global conveyor belt. And I like this one because it gives you a good image of um, where the water's moving around in the ocean. So you have cold, salty water, dense water sinking towards the bottom in the blue. And then in the red, it's warmer, fresher water. And that's less dense and it's rising to the surface. And that kind of is the, a good generalization of what you would really wanna focus on for the abiotic section. If you go through those slides and you understand those concepts, you, you really should be good to go. And all the concepts are backed with resources on the webpage. I'll go over that uh, further later on. And we're gonna move forward to biotic. So here's where I need you to know food webs how energy is flowing within an aquatic ecosystem. I want you to be able to identify common, rare, threatened, and endangered species, as well as what we call aquatic nuisance species. So knowing the difference between those and what some common ones are. Um, there are questions where you're using dichotomous keys and those resources will be available for you during the test, but due to the time consumed using the dichotomous key and answering the question, I do recommend you just familiarize yourself with the dichotomous key. Um, it'll make things a little easier for you on the test. And be familiar with aquatic plants and animals visually and descriptively. Uh, we have a video going over fish anatomy where I show you different parts of the fish and looking at these different factors will help you to identify a fish beyond just looking at their color and their size and shape. The fins and structures of their mouth can also be clear giveaways of what species you have. And the same goes for plants um, and the same goes for macroinvertebrates. All right. And this slide here is more so to give a visual representation of the difference between a biosphere, an ecosystem, a community, and a habitat. Um, so the habitat is where the plant or animal naturally lives and grows. So you can think of 
It has their special place, their home within the community. And then the ecosystem is the community. Uh, the difference between the two is important to know, but also knowing that in ecosystems, things are flowing together. Uh, you're having a recycling of nutrients um, and everything's interconnected. Sorry. On. And here's an example of a food web. This is just a Chesapeake Bay food web. And I like it because it also has the trophic levels on the side. And just under, understanding how food webs are drawn, knowing that when the arrow is pointing from the larger fish to the osprey, it means the osprey is eating the larger fish, the larger fish is eating the smaller fish, and the smaller fish is eating zooplankton and phytoplankton. You also can see the trophic levels, the producers versus the consumers, and going all the way up to the top predators. Um, Another good thing to note is when you take something out of this food web, the cascade effect, the impacts that we'll have, if you take the osprey out or the bald eagle out, you'll have an increase in the amount of larger fish and ducks, which would mean they're eating more of those lower consumers, so on and so forth. The list can go on. I recommend you practice, go on a hike and sit down and draw your own food web. Um, that's a good way to uh, practice and make sure you understand the concept. And I put here biotic slash aquatic environments because questions like this are gonna come up in both sections. The difference, knowing the difference between native, non-native, and then invasive. Um, that's just why I have that on the title. So non-native is just meaning it's a plant or animal in a location that it's not naturally evolved in. It's not in its range. Um, if it's native, it means it is in its natural range. And not all non-native non plants are invasive. And that can get kind of tricky. An invasive species is going to be something that is really intrusive or detrimental to the ecosystem. Um, so an example of a non-native plant that's not super invasive would be honeysuckle. Animals can still use it. Uh, whereas a plant that's pretty invasive could be phragmites. It will displace other organisms and it's not really doing much for the ecosystem either. Um, and then just some introduction methods, ways these, these invasive species and non-native species can arrive here is a lot of piggybacking, coming in on boats, um, shoes, taking your equipment from one place to another. So it's really important we rinse these things off, uh, make sure everything's clean. Uh, we don't wanna spread the invasives. And also unwanted pets getting released. Red-eared sliders are a big uh, non-native species here and they're often pets that have been released into this area. Different controls would be biological removal, uh, chemical, using herbicides, pesticides, just physically removing things, actually pulling plants or pulling species away, um, and public education, like what we're doing now, explaining these things to the public and teaching each other how to be um, stewards of our environment. And we can move forward. This is important. Make sure that you can ID the more common species of our area. Just And I, I listed a few here. I obviously can't tell you what you're gonna be tested on, but these are just some common species that you should be able to identify using a dichotomous key or by looking at them. You will be I guess limited since the test is virtual this year, you will have to be looking at a picture. I think normally we would have an actual specimen in front of you that you could look at and see everything really close up. Um, so we're at a slight disadvantage, but I think if you really practice and, and look at pictures of these animals and look at videos, it will be pretty easy for you guys. Um, so top left, that picture right there is a bluegill sunfish. The middle one is a white perch. 
And then that one on the bottom left is the invasive fish, the blue catfish. Uh, I recommend you know the invasive fishes and the northern snakehead. I'll move forward. Some more aquatic invasive species here. Again, the northern snakehead. This is um, a very intrusive fish. They, they're very fit and they can outcompete a lot of the species around them based on their biology and their adaptations. Uh, they defend their eggs. They can reproduce throughout the year. Uh, they have massive strong bodies and big mouths with scary teeth, <laughs> but they're very tasty. So we encourage anglers to fish for them and they are a catch and kill species. So if you get a snakehead when you're fishing, you, you cannot transport it live anywhere. You have to catch and kill. You can't put it back in the water. Uh, they're pretty impressive. So they can literally cross land with their fins. They can survive out of water for a very long time as well. So this is a catch kill species. The zebra mussels on the right is like a pig, one of those piggyback species. They often get transported around on boats. Somehow they're uh, larval stage or getting attached to things and then spreading. The bottom right picture is the Phragmites I was talking about. Um, you see them a lot of times where you would normally see cattails. Um, and that, those are some important ones to note. And here are, you know, same thing, but submerged aquatic ve vegetation, the plants underneath the water. Um, the top two pictures are hydrilla. The one on the left is just like a close up of someone holding it. The picture on the right is what you would see, let's say Patuxent River um, in the shallower areas in your boats, you'll see huge mats of hydrilla. Um, that can be bad for boat props. This could suffocate um, by blocking the sun on the surface. Temperatures can get really warm in mats of hydrilla as well. And we learned lower oxygen and warmer waters. So that's not great. And the species at the bottom left is our native widgeon grass, um, a common uh, native one, not invasive. And the value of these, they are nurseries for small fish or fish reproducing. Uh, they increase the oxygen in the water. They help filter the water. Overall submerged aquatic vegetation is a good thing. And here I just put an Atlantic Midhaven slide because it is um, supports one of the largest commercial fisheries on the Atlantic coast very important fish. It'll teach you a lot. Doing some research on this fish will teach you a lot about commercial fishing, uh, impacts of commercial fishing, regulation. Osprey eat a lot of menhaden. They're used for pet food. Uh, it's really a cool thing to learn about and it'll help you understand topics that you might see on the test. Another big one for the biotic section are your macroinvertebrates, and that is because they have these sensitive orders. So if you have an abundance of the sensitive orders, you can assess that you have a pretty healthy stream. So these species are really useful in determining stream health. You, again, use a dichotomous key. I recommend you practice with at least one of them. You will have two on the test. There's two different kinds the DNR state dichotomous key, as well as Stroud's dichotomous key, um, whichever one you prefer to use. Whatever one of them is a little, has more graphics, one has more words, whichever way you learn better, both will be available. Just get comfortable with one of them and being able to identify based on a picture. Again, you won't have a live specimen, it's gonna be a picture. Um, and you wanna be able to get to the family level. Uh, and to do this, you're gonna be looking at number, uh, number and length of tails, location of the gills, thickness, shape, eyes, body, all of that. Um, your sensitive orders are gonna be mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, and water pennies for the most part. Uh, you have your moderately sensitive ones, um, alderflies, craneflies, and damselflies, and then your super tolerant ones like blackflies. Um, 
And for the health of a stream, not only do you want an abundance of the sensitive orders, but you want species richness, you want a diversity kind of of all of them. Um, but for the sake of the test, IDing is the most important. And yes, yeah, so here's those sensitive orders. We can keep going because I already went over that. This is an, an anatomy key here. If you don't already know the general anatomy of the macroinvertebrates, I would study this so that you can properly use the dichotomous key as you're going along. But we don't have to stay here too long. Okay. And on to aquatic environments. These are the main points we need to know. We want to identify aquatic and wetland environments based on their physical, chemical, and biological characteristics. We want to know the characteristics of different types of aquifers, uh, specifically coastal aquifers. I just chose that based on where we are. And understanding historical trends. No, definitely know the, the uh, physiological provinces of Maryland. Um, that's an important one. There's a map and a slide coming up. And be able to describe the difference between, as I said, these are overlapping, not native, non-native, and invasive species. And just showing, explaining the pictures at the bottom. Um, to the left is like a beachy area where they had have done some planting to try to restore that living shoreline and prevent further erosion. And in the middle is a basic Maryland stream and forested stream. And to the right is an aerial view of a marsh in Jug Bay, which is on the Patuxent River. We also want you guys to know sort of fish migration when they're spawning. Um, so anadromous fish are fish that are migrating upriver from the, the sea, from the ocean to spawn. Um, and the example there, I have yellow perch. And then catadromous is the opposite. They're going from the river out to sea to spawn. And the only catadromous species we have is the American eel. Okay. Here is the effects on coastal waters um, in regards to those aquifers I was talking about. These are the coastal aquifers. And the picture here is showing saltwater intrusion. Uh, I would focus on these type of aquifers and this impact. Um, the graph really clearly shows you the where the water table lies. Uh, it shows the different like rock grain size in the water table versus um, underneath. And you can see where a freshwater pump is, a pump well. And it shows you how if you're over pumping, that's going to lower the water table and it's going to allow for salt water to intrude into that fresh water. And that's salt water intrusion. And groundwater is one of our most valuable resources, even though it's something we never really see uh, or think about too much. The, um, and the wells can be drilled into and over pumped which causes issues. It's important to know how much that recharge rate is and that deals with precipitation. Um, you don't want it to run dry, that's a huge thing. And you don't want it to um, eliminate, I guess, from the saltwater intrusion. And there's a resource that I have on the site where there's a whole paragraph that goes along with this graph. And I would recommend just reading through that, understanding what's happening. But if you understand that over pumping, over the recharge rate can allow for saltwater intrusion, um, that's imp important to understand. Here are those physiographic provinces that I told you you should really know. You have the five main ones, Appalachian Plateau, Ridge and Valley, Blue Ridge, Piedmont, and Coastal Plain. Um, so the Appalachian covers about 6% of the state, and it's the only one that's draining um, both the Chesapeake Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. 
Then you have your Ridge and Valley Province, which is about 12% of the state. You've got your Blue Ridge, which covers 5% of the state, and Piedmont, which covers about 29% of the state. And then your Coastal Plain, that big yellow section, that's the largest province that we have covering about 48% of the state. Um, these channels are easily eroded and the western boundary is right on the fall line. So between the coastal and the Piedmont and much of it is sand and gravel. And now we're moving into our last, the last section of what will be the aquatic test and that's water protection and conservation. Here's where you're gonna want to know and interpret different laws, federal, state laws, and the methods they use to protect water and water quality and conserve it. We want you to be familiar with the federal, state, and county agencies that provide oversight of these laws or oversight of these methods um, and understand the impacts that climate change is gonna have um, specifically on us in Maryland. We're almost through here. We have, here's the agency that oversees local water management plans, the Maryland Department of the Environment. And here are some examples of issues they face with climate change. And we all experience them now to the presently, higher temperatures, um, increased flooding, um, shifting precipitation patterns. I think 2018 was like the highest rainfall we've had in Maryland ever. And there are droughts. Rising sea level rise is huge. I live in Annapolis and Cape St. Clair. The flooding and our beaches eroding, it's very clear. Um, changes in water demand and then deteriorating quality. So these are all climate change issues that these local and federal agencies have to oversee. The next slide I have is, I'm trying to help out because there are a few questions about best management practices that agriculture groups need to follow or we want them to follow. There's a lot of agriculture in Maryland. And specifically, I wanted to focus on the agrochemical handling facilities. Um, and below there, it's just understand the benefits of these best management practices. And here's an example, this facility, it's providing a stable, safe place. Um, if there is a spill, this can help you clean it up or prevent it from going out into the soil. Um, it can be beneficial to the farmer themselves, keeping the chemicals away from them and um, reducing the potential for accidental spills. The next slide, is just more of those best management practices for farmers. Uh, a lot of them are used to reduce erosion, but it's also to keep waterways clean. For instance, the livestock fencing is keeping the cows from being able to, you know, do their business in the creek or hang out in the creek, which is adding more nutrients, excess nutrients to that waterway. The fencing is keeping them out, simple. Um, riparian buffers, planting trees, and cover crops, uh, things of that nature. So just having maybe a few of these and knowing how they benefit and what they do. And on this slide, I it's really important that you all know TMDLs, so the total maximum daily load, and that is measuring nitrates, phosphorus, and sediment. Um, it is established by the EPA for the Chesapeake Bay and the Chesapeake Bay has um, six states in a district. So the map there showing you, you've got Delaware, us in Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, and then the District of Columbia, DC. And all these measures, they have a goal for in place by 2025. And the last couple slides is water use. So knowing um, the average water use, basic water use. So Maryland's water use in order from largest to smallest is toilets, 
clothes, shower, faucets, leaks, and then bath. Um, but in our whole, um, in all of America, in the United States, we have four states that take up one fourth of the U.S. withdrawals, and that's California, Texas, Idaho, and Florida. And then there's a list there of eight categories of water use and just know um, the main, know those main eight categories. And then the two highest are thermoelectric power and irrigation. Um, that's what the, that's what we're, our water use mostly comprises of or the highest water use that we have. Um, and Lastly, after understanding water use, what we use it for, how much we're using, then we can go in and understand how we can conserve it and protect it. So have a few ideas, something maybe you already do or just would like to do in the future of ways to conserve water yourself, both in the home and outside of the home. Uh, basic things that we all know when you're brushing your teeth, don't just leave the faucet running, take a shorter shower, um, one thing that was new for me was checking on leaks. Leaks are a huge uh, water issue. Uh, replacing shower heads, replacing pipes, um, running a full load of laundry, things like that. And then outside of the home, I know schools do a lot of rain gardens. You can do this at home at, as well. The use of rain barrels, uh, drip irrigation, as opposed to just using your hose and throwing it all around. Uh, you can even wait to mow your lawn, let it get two to three inches before you go and mow your lawn, and that can help. Uh, so just have a few ideas of this and be able to explain how you would do it, and you'll be good to go on that. Um, and I just blew through that PowerPoint, and I had some pre-registered questions, so I'm going to go ahead and answer those first. I know we don't have too much time left, but I'll go through these and then I'll address the chat questions and anything else you guys have. Um, so first, the first question I had was, what topics do we need to study the most? Um, I hopefully the PowerPoint helped a little bit with that. And I'll just reiterate for the abiotic section, I want you to think about how water moves globally, and then how it gets to you and your watershed, and then understand what the watershed, what a watershed is, how it's going to benefit ecosystems and the economy, and then how the organisms within it are benefited as well. For biotic, I would say, what do organisms need to survive? If you know what the organisms in an aquatic environment need to survive. That will help you. And how they interact with each other, that's very important. And again, the species ID, uh, being able to do that and use the dichotomous key. Um, for aquatic environments, knowing those physiological provinces, uh, the difference between native, non-native, and invasive, knowing some of those common, common ones, um, and oh, ways to measure and improve aquatic environments. For the last section, water protection, understand those major laws, the TMDLs, um, understand water usage, understand best management practices, and know which agencies are, are uh, enforcing and overseeing these. Uh, the next question, someone asked, what is the best way to find or catch aquatic creatures and plants to identify when the water is really murky? For this, I would say you can use pretty much the same methods. It, the water being murky doesn't always mean it's, it's dirty. Sometimes after a rain event, it can increase the amount of sedimentation. It can bring up some of the mud from the bottom. So it might be murkier than normal. But you can still find macroinvertebrates. You can still um, do some sampling. For this, maybe you would want to really target rocks and leaves and um, branches, substrate, something that they might latch onto. Um, in the past, I've used like soft brushes 
In one of our videos, we do a little shuffle with our feet and then catch it with the D-net. But you could also maybe use some soft brushes to try to get more off um, and collecting the leaves. Sifters would be useful if you're dealing with a lot of sediment. And um, also just letting it sit for a minute. If you take your big sample and pour it in a white bin and let it settle, let that sediment settle down to the bottom and it's not moving around. And then when you check back in, maybe five, 10 minutes later, you might start seeing those little things swimming around, make it a little easier. Um, and if all else fails, you can also try fish staining with a big net uh, or just fishing. And as long as you have a bucket of water on the side, you can you know, literally remove these from the water, do your identification, take your notes and release them back. The next question was, will we be able to zoom in on pictures? I believe so. Um, I know with the resources that are provided to you, it you click it and it will shoot out to another window, but you're still within the UMD system. It just allows you to be able to look and click back and take as much time as you need. Um, without leaving the test, but I'm gonna let April chime in just to clarify if you can zoom in on pictures or not. Yeah, um, I believe so on the test. I mean, we have made the pictures on the test quite large um, compared to what they would be if they were on paper already. And then you can always zoom in with your browser window if nothing else. But as Chelsea mentioned, all the resources you absolutely can zoom in on because they'll open up in basically a PDF viewer that you would have the ability to like zoom really in or really far out, however you'd like to see it. Um, but the actual pictures um, on the exam themselves, we've made them quite large, so they should be very visible. And then within your browser window, at the very least, you should be able to um, zoom in. Um, yeah. Thank you, April. Great, so that answers that question. Uh, another one was, what will the test format look like for the virtual competition? I will say honestly, is very similar to your regular paper test. I sent a document and we just reformatted it to be in the virtual setting. Really, it's just the downside of not having these things right in front of you, these animals right in front of you and not actually doing the water testing. Um, so I guess it's more about concepts um, than knowing exact answers, which can kind of be good for you guys. Uh, as long as you understand the concepts, you should be doing just fine. Um, they're mostly fill in the blank, like I said, multiple choice. There are some short answers, a few matching, maybe a drawing, and then links to resources. So my tip would just be on some of them, just time management, don't hang on too long on any one question. Uh, keep an eye on your time, but we adjusted it so that the sections that do have those things have more allotted time than the ones that don't. So you, you should have plenty of time to do them. Um, and for aquatics, as I said before, it's four sections, abiotic, biotic, aquatic environment, and the water conservation and protection. It's, I think, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, 40 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, and it does not matter which section you start with first. You can start with the very last section and it does not matter. You, you don't have to do them in order. But I do believe um, once you start a section, you have to finish it. Okay, yeah, she said that. <laughs> yeah, so each section, Chelsea has about 15 questions in each section. Um, but the different times as you mentioned are a lot based on what you have to utilize resource wise. Um, and then um, once you're in a section, you do have to complete it. You have two hours total to complete all four sections. It should not take you two hours, but if you have, if you want to use the time, you're welcome to. Um, what was I going to say? Um, when, once you're in a section, you can see all the questions for that section at once. Um, and until you hit that final submit, you can go back and change what answers, re you know, rethink your answers, all of that. Um, it's very similar to um, if you're using Schoology or another online learning platform. Um, I have not personally used it, but it's the same concept and very similar to that. It's just the University of Maryland system, um, but it's very similar to those that you might ex have experienced this past year in your high schools. 
All right, and then another one, will students receive a specific set of questions or a study guide for each category? Unfortunately, due to the nature of the way um, Maryland Aquatics uses a test bank, we don't do study guides, um, but I will say the resources on my page in parentheses, it usually will say, you know, first paragraph or page this, this, and this. Um, and so maybe if you divvy up those resources in your team and make sure you go through each of them, I would say your that would be your main focus. Follow up with the PowerPoint and then the videos. And even now we have also this recorded session and I have no doubt you guys will be doing well on the test. It seems like a lot of resources, but remember a few of them are available at the test. Um, so remember that. And it usually is a, just a one page. It seems overwhelming, but it, it really is usually just a one page. Um, and the additional resources at the bottom are more so just to help reiterate things if you're confused or you wanna do more practice. Um, let's see. And then the last two I got sort of closer to the end of the day. Um, how different will the content be overall and specifically aquatics with the hands-on activities? That really is the only difference in the content is there is no hands-on activities. Otherwise, same old drill, really. <laughs> it's just virtual. And so we're not actually looking at, for instance, a rockfish on a tray and you guys have to identify it or label the parts, it's going to be a picture, that kind of thing. Um, that will be the main difference. Then the last question I had that I know of was what question is often missed the most? I didn't use those. That's <laughs> my answer. I tried to take the bank I had and work with what was going on this year and I can't really answer that. I, there isn't one that was misanswered the most. There's a few tiebreakers for when I'm grading, but that isn't something you guys need to worry about. Um, yeah, I would say don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, now I guess I have like eight minutes. If there's questions in the chat, let me pull it up really quick. Okay. Slings, slings, slings. Oh, one question a person asked me privately. Oh, the PowerPoint. Yeah, so the PowerPoint is at, is live right now. Um, if you go to the Maryland State Aquatic Resources page, um, which I think they can drop in the chat, they might have already dropped it. You can download a PDF of it or download the actual, you know, slides. And that has like notes in them. You can study those. So yes, that will be available. What is the best way to study aquatic insects? That's a good question. Um, Stroud, the resource I gave as one of the dichotomous keys on their website, I highly recommend playing around there. They have really cool, um, like zoomed in microscope images of them and them swimming around and they'll show you their larval stage and the adult stage. It also gives like different species so you can look at the differences. That would be a really great virtual resource. Um, otherwise, I would say go out and do a macro hunt, collect some and practice and see, see what you come up with. You can do it at any other time of any time of the year. Um, see. Ex da, da, da. Um, just a second, if, if Amy, if you're there, is she there? I don't know. To explain the importance of stream order. was here but she may have had to scoot out okay i wasn't sure if, okay um let me see i would say for you guys 
on the resources, there's Maryland Streams called Take a Closer Look. And there is a page specifically to go to. I would recommend looking at that. But there's tons of resources. Oh, and I saw another one. It's kind of hard. I thought I saw one more. Okay. Okay, yeah. It's long. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay, if not, we are about five minutes early. And I just wanna say um, thank you everybody for attending. I hope this was helpful for your test questions. Uh, I'm sorry we can't be in person, but I'm glad to see you all still, still in there and doing the Envirothon. Um, my email is up on the site. You can always reach out to me if you're having difficulties getting the PowerPoint or if you have other questions. And um, also remember this is recorded. You can come back to it. And there is another session April 9th. It'll be the same thing, I think April, right? <laughs> Maybe different questions. So if you don't attend, you might wanna watch it. Just a heads up. Uh, otherwise, we're, we're all set for today. That's exactly what I was going to say to wrap this up, Kelsey. So thank you so much. Um, yep. It, it, visit the Maryland and Maritime website. There's lots of really great information on there. Um, I will be emailing you all with next steps for, um, you know, getting started with the virtual competition. And more information will be available as we get closer to competition. But, you know, for now, just worry about studying, think about content, everything else will fall into place, and you'll be hearing from us soon. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, as we mentioned, this is recorded, it will be on the website in the next few days, um, as well as there are additional sessions um, coming up for soils, wildlife, forestry, and as well, the other aquatic session. So we hope you and your teammates can join us and Thank you all so much for being part of Envirothon and have a wonderful evening.